Welcome back everybody. Thanks for joining me again down here in the lair. It is time to get on to build video number two of the T6A Texan II from Gator RC. If you're interested in this Balsa R or many others, especially the Warbird line, make sure you hop over there to check them out. But uh, this video, we're going to try and hit all the, the key points throughout the build manual that may have been a miss in there that I want to keep you informed about tips and tricks along the way. But right now, it's time for a sneak preview of this beauty. Check this thing out. There it is. I hope you guys stick around and check all the vids. You're going to enjoy them. Can't wait to get this thing up in the air. All right, building tip for you guys. When you go to put in the control horns, make sure that you put it on the right side. They they do this, I'm assuming, for building, but there is a hole there and a hole there. It, they're both covered up, and you have to make those holes, as you saw I did with the um, covering pencil. But on the bottom side, they actually did poke a small hole on this side and this side, which that one really shouldn't have been done, just this one. And the reason that I'm sure they did it, like I said, when they make the wood, they don't want to make the wood directional for only one side or the other. So with the rudder, you want to make sure that it's on the left-hand side, that you have that in there because they want you to epoxy that bolt in for strength. And I do wick some CA into that wood around there before I epoxy it in. But again, back to the elevator, you can see that the elevator has the servo pocket literally right there. So you want to make sure that this is going to go on that correct side not on both sides don't make too many holes and here's the exit for the rudder now we're going to place in the vertical stabilizer in the hole so we can mark the covering just taking a sharpie run it along the edge of the fuselage and just make a line right up the side of this thing so we can take it off and we do that on both sides we're going to heat and press the covering down first right above it. And then we're going to use a straight edge and a X-Acto knife to cut below that line. We do not want to cut on the line or above it. And we are going to do that on both sides. So we have that set up and we know where we want to mark and cut that thing. Now we're going to go ahead and do the horizontal. And we're going to lay this thing in there like that. I'm going to get a piece of rough tape just to hold it in place. And now I'm going to get myself a string. Any string works. I got a T pin here that I am going to use for um, my center point. And I'm going to make the very center of the fuselage my center point. So I am literally going to push that right at that main fuselage former right up there. I've made myself a piece of tape to use as a marker you can see how that slides up and down now that string just looped around it and i am going to take this to the very edge of the corners of this tail and i'm going to slide the piece of tape up till it touches that corner and i'm going to adjust my piece of tape on the string so i know where it is as a marker and i come over here to this side and make sure it's the same do not stretch and pull on the string too tight because you can mess up your readings. But as far as centering this thing or sliding it left to right, this concept works really, really well. And uh, once you have this tail positioned where you want it, you want to go ahead and take your Sharpie. We're going to make two marks right here on the fuselage so we know where to line it up. And then underneath, I'm going to mark out where I am going to cut this thing. So when I take it back off, you can see my witness marks there and there and there. And now we're going to seal this with the iron, which we had already done prior steps. But I want to cut out just in the inside of that. And then I'm going to remove all of that Sharpie marker so it doesn't show through on our epoxy. The epoxy we're going to use in here, you should have at least 25 minute, 30 minute epoxy there, if not an hour or longer. Just like the wings, the very important pieces need important epoxy that really needs to soak down in. So let's go ahead and get everything uh, 
trimmed off covering wise, and then we are going to epoxy everything into place. And this step is probably one of the most important things that we are going to do for this plane. We are going to go ahead and set up the tail. And this is what really determines if you need tons of aileron to correct or tons of rudder to correct. And it's caused by misbuilding issues. So we want to make everything as square and uh, as, as aligned as we possibly can. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my level and I set my level up on the cockpit just to get a pretty close idea of what level might be with the plane with the wings. Can't set it on the wings, obviously, because of the dihedral and the wings. But I know the top of the cockpit's not super accurate, but it should be close. And that's what I'm looking for. So what I call level there, I'm now going to come back and actually check here because this spot on the fuselage where the tail mounts has to be level and we're going to see if the readings match and they do and what i'm going to do is actually just tweak this just a hair and i'll talk about later why that that's important so normally when we go to set our tail in you would go ahead and set your tail right in the inside your vertical stabilizer your rudder we would go ahead and set the tail in place like this. And then all we would do is use one of these cutout right angle gauges, if you will, and basically just place it against the rudder to see if it would be square and then adjust the, uh, the vertical stabilizer, tilt it one way or another in order to make that happen. Because of the way that the horizontal stab is bent. I don't want to say bent because it's the way it's made to be. There's actually a slight amount of anhedral in this thing. And you could tell um, through the build. And there's also a little bit of taper in the rudder. It doesn't allow us to do that. So what we have to do here is make sure that the saddle is square with this thing. So I'm going to use this right on here. To position against there and you could see there i hope on the camera angle that we have a little bit of space where it needs to be leaned that way we're going to get started now on the landing gear again on the front we're going to grind that flat spot on there this thing when it mounts into the nose will actually offset it appears not center but more towards the one side so we'll see how that works we have a nice long pre-made push rod here that'll go through the nose into our servo bay for our retract. And it is mislabeled in the book. They have the rudder here and then they list um, the steering servo actually up in what looks to be in this bay. But yet on the rudder servo, it's going to be a dual linkage for the rudder and the steering. So that's not going to quite be right. It looks like the way this is going to work out is most likely this bay is going to be for our retract. So we're going to mount that in there and see. Again, we're using the Spectrum high voltage retract servos in there and um, the wheels and tires that are included in this. So let's get into uh, retract installation.
when it comes down to installing the retract linkage for the main gear in the manual it shows you that this thing bends down in a 90 and back out again now these are just straight out so there is a variation between here and the book um, what i found easiest to do is to kind of curve or bend the linkage in a couple angles down then to come into the retract servo try and do this without the pockets in there until you achieve the fit that you like without putting any stress on the top of that servo arm right there so you want to be careful it doesn't drag on the underside of the top part of the wing so right underneath there you can trim a little bit if need be but try and make some bends in order to relieve some of that stress as they come in when it comes into these wheel pockets there is a good bit of trimming which makes the look somewhat undesirable but it's not it's not hateful uh, you're going to need to open up the pocket in the center in here and then right there so i did leave little tabs right there in order to keep some strength in the wheel pocket but those actually seem to fit in there get all my linkage out of the way and show you when those are ultimately in those actually fit in there pretty well and the wheel tucks in so we're going to wind up now drilling a couple screws probably right here and maybe two over here that way we can secure this thing down and remove it if need be the other option here is that we could go ahead and use um, some canopy glue and then tape this thing down and see how they turn out and maybe that that might be a decent option here just simply because we're going to put this thing on um, i have decided I, I am going to put that thing in there so we will go ahead and Maybe just canopy glue everything in. But the option is to drill some holes, use some small screws to hold that in. Or you can just straight up use canopy glue, which does hold very well. You can see here on our cockpit that that thing turned out great. And that canopy glue is not going to go anywhere. So um, second thought, I think I'm just going to canopy glue these things down. So let's get to it. In this step, we're going to go ahead and install the pilots in the cockpit. One of the things to note, when you do the trimming of the plastic, it will leave a white edge, which from the outside looking in will be undesirable. Trim up all of the cut edges with some black touch-up paint. They specify we're going to just use some clear epoxy here on the bottom. Once those are trimmed and put into place, um, 165 millimeters from there back, which will give you the spacing. For the next section here, pilots will go eight millimeters in front of each piece, and then the back headrest will get slid all the way back up against that edge. Time to install. You can go gas, you can go electric, and they give you the option for either and they make it pretty simple so let's talk about some of the things that i see and some of the things that we are going to do to this plane number one in the unboxing i kind of struggled getting the hatch off of this thing till i figured out why now there is a bolt underneath that you can pop a hole in the covering and put a set screw through there or a nylon bolt if you will to hold that nose on but i am telling you guys these magnets here are like 
They got these recessed dimples on them. This thing is super strong. I, I really don't think this thing will pop off on you. See how yours fits, but mine takes a good bit of effort to get under it and lift it. So um, if you don't trust it, you could do the screw at the top. My goal is to try and keep this thing clean and I'll discuss more of that in a minute. So I'm gonna try it with just the magnets. On the inside, we have this huge space right here. It's huge, huge space in the inside of there for batteries, all right? And then they supply you a battery tray if you're going to go electric so that thing is easily removable and you could pop that thing out, put a battery in and lay the whole thing in there, which I like. The firewall is already epoxy sealed, which is great. So if you don't know how to do that, usually you take some epoxy, thin it out with some uh, rubbing alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, and then you just brush it on a light coating and that seals it from any oil, fuel, things like that soaking in and ruining the firewall or really the whole aircraft. They put centering marks on here. And one of the big things I wanna point out to you guys, if you notice, this hole is not in the center here. So you don't have to, when you put your motor in, account for down and right thrust, it's already in there. And I verified this because if this hole is off center, when you tilt that prop or that motor this way, that will actually center in the front of the cowl so you don't have a crooked nose, and that's what we want. And if you measured the distance from here to here, this side is actually greater than this side here of the nose. So I know that this hole is off this way. You can see that distance in there because they already built in the thrust right in the firewall, which is really cool because now I don't have to worry about it. So we have witness marks here. One of the things that we are going to do is take a triangle or a builder's square, and I'm gonna make those lines all the way across. And then I'm also going to do the same thing here. So that way, when I transfer this piece onto there, they already have witness marks to line all that up. It makes it a lot easier. The nose on this thing is adjustable. So we do wanna make sure that that's square in there, but that will actually give us adjustment for motor depth. And I am going to show you guys the right way to install a motor or an engine or whatever to make sure that it's perfect in the cowling. When I do the install on the cow, the directions want you to drill holes in the side of the cowling and put screws in here. Although that's typical, I try and wanna keep this thing as clean as possible on the outside. I'll probably mount all my speed control switches and stuff in here. So that way it keeps the look clean. Any charging will be done through here. Um, but I don't want to put screws there. So what I'm going to do once this cowl is centered and the motor's in there, you really have a lot of space because this chin vent I will open up and we will have this thing fairly open with just a little bit of a prop hub in there. I would like to be able to put some L tabs on the inside of the cowling so I can just go in there with a long ball driver and put that canopy on uh, the nose of this thing without any issues. Some of the stuff that comes with this, again, electric option, the triangle bracing, which goes on the side. Remember, we can epoxy right on top of this stuff, so you're going to have to rough it up wherever any of this stuff is going to attach, all right? Very important items, use long-term epoxy, at least half an hour. When it comes down to gas, they give you some typical nylon mounts. We don't need those. Off they go. Um, we want to keep this thing clean. So what we are using, and it comes with a two and three quarter inch red spinner. I think I'm going to go with a three blade on this one. So I, I actually got an aluminum one coming as an upgrade that I purchased. Uh, so that thing will go off to the side as well. We are going to go a little bit big on this because I'm not 100% sure if I want to do 6S or 8S. But this is an 8S Jetty Mezzan Light. Um, 130 amp speed control. So this will be more than ample for this plane. The plane requires a power 60 um, system in there. Now I've opted for the power 90, the 325 KV motor. We'll get to the unboxing of this thing in a second to see what's in there. But I would rather have the power and not use it than not have the power and wish I, I had it or needed it. Um, so I opted for this based on the weight. It says ideal for planes up to 13 pounds. The um, Power 60 was good up to planes 10 to 11 pounds. Now we'll talk about some, um, some of the motor intricacies more in a minute, 
but we need roughly 100 to 110 watts for powered scale flight per pound. So we have to be able to achieve roughly, I'm gonna anticipate this as a 11 pound bird, so I need at least 1100 watts of power to get me where I need to be. We'll cut to how to figure all that stuff out in a little bit. But um, I like the Power 90 as a better choice in this over the recommendation of the Power 60. Personal preference, but we won't know how that works out till the Maiden. And then we have to check it on 6S and 8S and actually see where we wind up. Because it would be easy to do either one because both the motor and the ESC are capable of doing it. So let's get into the unboxing of the Power 90. If only somebody told me paying attention in math class would actually help you build better airplanes... I would have been sold, but here we are. So let's explain the power system in this thing. Start with the ESC. I'm running a Jetty Mezzan Light 130 amp ESC. Why such a big ESC? Because smaller ones, lighter ones were the same price or more. So this thing was up to 8S. It'll fit in a lot of different planes and projects. So I thought it was the best fit for me. Yes, it's a little bit more than what's required, but I'll go with it. The Power 90 system, same thing. They require a Power 60 as a bare minimum. A little bit more power is better, but there is a weight penalty that goes along with it. I knew I was adding lights. I knew I was adding a sound system. All of those things put Porky back here to stout 12 and a half pounds, so we have to make sure we have enough power to fly it. So I'm glad that I did, made the decision to go up because if you have more, you can use the throttle stick to actually control when you use it. If you didn't put it in a plane and you need more, you're in trouble. So anyway, uh, E-Flight with the Power 90 gave us some pretty nice uh, destructions right there and some guides. And I'm not a scientific electrical engineer, so a lot of the stuff that you could figure out with a lot of mathematical formulas to better suit this information psh, right here flies right over my head. I can give you basic wattage and I could give you what a good modeler needs to know as far as information. And that is we need roughly 110 watts for sport aerobatic flying, very good warbird flying, 110 watts per pound. I needed to know how much it weighed. And a lot of this information I'm not getting until the later part of the build, you're gonna get it first. So um, we came in at 12 and a half pounds, sound system lighting, the factory retracts, retract servos, everything in there. 12 and a half pounds with batteries ready to go. So I need um, at 110 watts per pound, per pound, 1375 watts for this thing. Now on 6S, if we used a 21 volt constant, so roughly three and a half volts a cell at 50 amps pulling constantly, we fell short and we're at 1050. Although it'll fly the plane, it's not gonna fly it the way I'd want it and nobody wants a bad flying plane. So we gotta make sure it's powered right. Now, I decided to go with the 8S at 28 volts, and at 28 volts at 50 constant amps, that puts us at 1,400 watts. So just on general information, that's going to be more than enough to fly the plane. So I did fish scale testing, passive thrust testing, like I do for a lot of stuff, and it's been fairly accurate. So from a modeler point of view, I know what feels right, I know what works, this plane put out 17 and a half pounds of thrust in its current configuration. It weighs 12 and a half. That's going to be more than enough to, to tear this thing down the runway and get it up in the air. It should be a very good flying plane at that. We are running a three blade master air screw 1610 and using the jetty black box telemetry. That's the great thing is I can look at peak amperage draw. I was at 72 amps at about 8200 RPM. How long will that last? I don't know, but that's, again, the great thing. I, I can monitor milliamp usage, and when I set my warning, as soon as I use that up, whether it's two minutes or 10 minutes based on that throttle stick, um, it's gonna tell me that it's time to land because I'm running low on power. So uh, that's kind of the deal there. It, it's time to land this thing, Mav. We're running low on fuel, man. Uh, wrong jet, but anyway, so, um, as far as the prop goes, we're running that 1610. I think we're actually going to drop that down a little bit, gain just a little bit more RPM. I think it's going to drop the amperage load a little bit, but still give us a little bit more power as well. Um, it'll spool up a little faster. I do like the slower spool of the bigger prop, especially on a Warbird. So we are going to fly it because I know it'll fly good the way it is. Throttle management, we're going to monitor battery time, and I think we're going to opt eventually down the road to hit that 15-inch three-blade prop in there. I think that's going to be the perfect fit for this thing. So back to the build. 
All right, guys, here we go. It's the unboxing of the Power 90 by eFlight. Now, this thing I picked up at GatorRC.com as well. Go over there and check them out. Everything for this build I picked up from them for the most part. A couple odds and ends pieces that I opted um, through other sources throughout the Internet. But for the most part, they are your one-stop hobby shop for all this cool stuff, including a full line of Seagull models. Go over there and check them out. But let's see what we got in here. Stickers. We always love stickers, right? Um... Looks like we got some hardware, another set of screws, looks like we got a prop nut and washer, oh look at that, got some bullets in there and some alley wrenches, and then we have some hubs. So we have a bolt-on hub, and then we have the slide-over hub with the uh, lock screws or the grub screws in the side of there, so uh, I guess depending on what side of the motor we're going to go off of is going to determine that, so we will see that as we get in here. And then it looks like we got a, a mount, nice recess. This is a uh, aluminum. This is a uh, pretty stiff aluminum too. Very robust mount for this this motor. And here she is. Now this is really for me going to be one of the first big motors that's just a strictly outrunner, and it's an outrunner because the outside of this thing turns and not the center portion. But um, we can either mount it one way and hold it and it'll spin this end or you can mount it and hold it this way and spin the other way but uh super cool i really really i really think what we're going to wind up using here is the bolt-on hub probably this way i'm assuming and let that portion stick into the plane have it all mounted up looks like like this make sure you put the tapered spots that way uh, we're always going to use Loctite on those so that way they don't vibrate loose. So we're going to get that mounted. We'll get this mounted. And then this bad boy is going to get stuck right in that motor box. Looks like this. So that will be pretty awesome. Get this thing mounted up and centered. Super excited to get this power system put in here. But it looks like a really nice quality motor. Um, what matters to me is how it flies, what it sounds like, the noise levels and stuff like that. So... Uh, we're really hoping that we we made a nice choice with this one. I hope this works out. So let's get into the build, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy it. Thanks for joining me along the adventure. Time lapse. Build tip. We've roughed up all of this stuff now. We knew exactly where our box is going to go. That's going to get epoxied in and clamped. On the inside, figuring out this battery tray by the directions will be a little bit different. First, you're going to go ahead and CA in this plate. Now, notice that this plate, as it fits here in the top, see how that notches in and that one doesn't. That small end will go down here in this hole like that. And we will install that thing, push down in, and then fit it into the top peg. And then here, if you're using a regular fuel tank for a gas installation, you're going to use those brackets to wrap your straps through if you're going electric we're going to put this plate in and if you see that jig that jig notches down in that keyway in the back so this plate slides in and out if you slide that thing into that keyway and then go to tighten it down you'd wind up breaking the plate so we're going to have to remove those two tabs which you could do with a pair of diagonal cutters just cut them right off so that way this thing would slide in and out and then we can use just some simple screws to hold the plate in. So, but once that's put in there, uh, our Velcro straps will actually be under this plate. So I'm not worried about taking the plate in or out. So it'll be secured and then our straps will be fastened here. This one is made for gas. So that strap is held in place. So let's get to hacking and gluing. build tip so what we did is we drilled some small holes just like that one right up here so we put a uh, rubber washer underneath and then another one just for a spacer those are only temporary and what they do is they give me friction so i really have to force this plate to slide for adjustment and i did the exact same thing on the other side 
So when I have this, and I'll show you in the next step how we center this motor, I have some resistance to set not only my depth, but any side to side that I may need on top of that. Um, we've started all of our bolts through our, what I'll call the firewall or the engine mounting plate. And we installed the blind nuts just enough on the backside so they start to grab. And then we'll fill those gaps with epoxy and then we'll tighten those up so it pulls that through and really kind of seals off those blind nuts on the inside. And I don't have to worry about getting epoxy or glue all over the backside. To center this motor was very easy because they already had crosshairs on this plate. And all I did was extend them out with a pen so I can see them. And on, hopefully you guys can see it, on the motor plate itself, all I did was find center of the shaft and mark it on that plate there and on this side and then just made all the lines line up. So I know my motor is as center as I need. And if I have to, I can adjust it a little bit. But this cowling, as we go on, my hope was that I would be able to reach because of the hub. I never took into account the size of the outrunner itself. So I'm not going to be able to actually access those tabs from the inside like I wanted to do. But um, needless, needless to say, we'll find something here on the outside to mount this cowling that still makes it look clean. So we'll, uh, we'll get it done. But uh, you know, it's just the part of crafting your own ARF to make things look as good as possible. We'll see what we can do. All right, guys, we are going to go over one of the best ways to center a motor or an engine. If you have um, ever done this before, you know the difficulty in getting the spacing right in the center circle, as well as getting the spinner lined up and the clearance, the gap. If it's not right, it rubs. If it's too far away, it looks stupid. If it's crooked, it looks bad, whatever. So I'm going to show you how we do this. Now, first thing I did is, again, we did the spacers inside to kind of hold this motor assembly where we wanted it. So we'll just pull it up in all goofy position like that. I already know by the paint lines about where I wanted my cowling. So I've gone ahead and marked those things. So that way all my position is good. And then I'm just having some tape to hold it in place. And you could paint mark the side so you don't mess that up. Now, when you look at the motor in the front of this thing, you could see how we have no spacing there and a lot of spacing here. And then we're also looking at depth. So the easiest way to do this is to take your spinner. If you have a metal one, they work better because plastic distorts and you have to be careful. Attach the cone to the top to make it as flat as possible. Put that thing over that motor and literally start to look at the spacing around the outside as well as the center. So all I'm going to do is just slide this spinner and motor around until I have it positioned. And you can do it here if you want to rough it up. I'm looking at depth and distance and center and it doesn't take much. And we do it this way so the motor sitting or engine would be sitting flat and it makes it pretty easy. So my depth is good. My spacing around is pretty even. All right, there, maybe just one more little tweak. Like that. And that looks, that looks perfect, but yeah. Standing it up like this. Now, bigger models, you'll need a hand. Um, you'll have to stand on steps like I did with Ruby, the Carf 330. So uh, just an easy way to do that. Now, gently lift this thing off. We can go ahead and peel the tape or whatever method you use to secure your cowl. If it's already pre-drilled and you have bolts, that's best. And if you didn't do it yet, I can always move this around to tweak it after I mount the motor in there if I don't like something. So we can go ahead and pull that off. And then all you do is go ahead and mark your bolts there or on the side, whatever it is that you want to do um, as far as positioning. My motor's already mounted in that plate, so I just mark mine here on the sides and I'm good. 
but that thing will look absolutely perfect on the front end of this thing. So there you go. Now they say that there's supposed to be metric 3 by 10 screws that go through the cowl in here. And unless I'm missing them, I don't see them anywhere. And I'm not going to go poking holes right here in the covering and make that all ugly trying to find them. I, I've searched forever here and literally can't find nothing. Um, so we're going to opt to do this my own way anyway. So uh, again, now we're time, it's time to get this cowling on there. And again, I marked the outside, so I have a rough idea of where I want this thing to go. We are going to throw on, and this is not the spinner I'm going to use, but it'll work. And I was debating, this is a 17, um, or I'm sorry, a 16 by 12 prop that I was going to initially use. And I think I've changed my mind and decided to go with a three-blade prop in either an aluminum spinner and or um, a red plastic one that's vented to keep that motor having airflow. But we'll see. The jury's not 100% out there yet. But anyway, I'm going to now use um, my spinner and that back plate for my spacing here and um, that looks pretty good there right now and all I'm going to do is just get a feel for exactly where I want this cowl to be and then we're going to take some tape and I'm going to mark some holes so you can fine tune your motor installation if it's off a of hair simply by using your fingers on this thing to literally make it perfect. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use some metric stainless and black washers for dress up in there. And then the option really becomes, do you want to use anti-vibration fuel tubing in those holes? Make them a little bit bigger than this. The fuel tubing, the silicone will slide in this and then that will go in there. So that way the cowl is never vibrating on the screw. Um, I prefer, I think, initially, I'm just going to make those holes just big enough for these screws, but I'm going to make it in far enough so if I ever had to do that, I could. But I usually use CA, and I harden the back side of that cowl, and then when I tighten these down, I don't have any issues. We'll put those into the fuselage, and then what we'll do is we'll um, harden that up, thread them in, take them out just like we did in the wing, and we're going to harden up everything there. So we'll get our last piece of tape, make sure this cowl is centered. Before we drill. All right, guys, I'm going to eyeball this up a little bit and uh, make sure it's perfect. And then we'll cut back to drilling. We're going to go ahead and mount up our Jetty Mezzin ESC. This is a design that I came up with for a lot of my ESCs. I have my boy Donnie Clark at Sky Monkey RC. He hooks me up with some prints um, and you can see the nice clean cage that will create. And the nice part about this is it will allow airflow all the way around it. Now, ideally I would, I guess, like to turn this the other way for the airflow to run in there. But due to the length of the ESC, I would have to cut into there or stick up into here and any airflow is better than no airflow, but I'm convinced because we'll have airflow all the way around this and we'll exit it. Uh, we'll cut some notches out in the bottom of the cowl. I'm not worried about airflow. We'll be definitely good on the airflow end, but uh, let's get this bad boy mounted up in there.
It is time to get the canopy put on here. Uh, we are going to use some canopy glue by Zap. This stuff works really well, but it just takes a little bit to dry and uh, a little bit goes a long way here. Too much and it, it smushes out all over the place. So go very, very lightly with this. We're going to take our heating iron and we're going to press down all these seams again to make sure everything in and around the canopy is good and tight. And then we are going to go ahead and make sure that this is clean because once you seal it up, Unless you're going to mount it with screws, it is sealed up. And that means the inside of the canopy as well. You don't want to be touching all this with your fingers on the inside. Because then in the sunlight, all you're going to see is these dirty paw marks in there. And we don't want that. So we're probably going to clean this up. We're going to use a microfiber and some glass cleaner. And then take some uh, a covering of alcohol on a rag and wipe that off in there to make sure that everything is spotless. And then we're going to go ahead and glue this bad boy down. Away we go. Well, this is like watching paint dry, kind of. We're watching canopy glue dry. So while the canopy glue is drying, we're gonna go ahead and get some uh, bullets soldered up here for our ESC. And we're also going to be removing the switch out of the jetty so this thing just stays powered up all the time when the battery is in, like most planes. And of course, we'll have a throttle kill hooked up to it. So away we go. Thanks everybody for watching. If you're a current subscriber or new to the channel, I appreciate your time immensely. If you're interested in more Balsa ARFs like the Texan 2 or something else in the Warbird or civilian line, I want you guys to head on over to www.gator-rc.com and check out their huge selection of Balsa ARF airplanes that they carry from Seagull models, um, Top RC model, many other manufacturers, your one-stop hobby shop. Otherwise, if you guys liked it, please smash that like button down below. If you didn't like it, make sure you hit that thumbs down button twice for me. As always, like, share, subscribe. Make sure you hit the bell notification and select all so you get made aware of all of my content. We will continue the build series here of the Seagull Models Texan 2 from Gator RC. We will move forward in the build process and I'll make sure I share all that content. I hope you guys check it out. Uh, again, it's Brendan from here, just playing crazy. Peace out. Happy flights.